Um, for those of you who don't know me, I am uh, Dr. Bobby Barons. It's my pleasure to serve as the Vice President and Campus Director for this campus. And I am super excited uh, to do an introduction today to a pretty amazing speaker and an amazing individual. I know you're going to leave here very inspired. And um, come on in, guys, and just ready um, to persevere and keep going after your dreams. So we're extremely fortunate to have former Philadelphia Eagle Kevin Riley here to share his inspirational story with you. Kevin is also a Wilmington native, a cancer survivor, and the author of a book entitled Tackling Life. Following Kevin's presentation this morning, be sure to stick around for some pictures with him. He will also be signing copies of his book, which he is selling for half price, just $10 for Delaware Tech students. So now I present to you Kevin Riley. What can you do to try to pick up the guys around you and keep things positive? I'm looking down this tunnel, I'm the last guy in there, and there's 70,000 screaming fans out there, and a couple million on TV. I'm checking the back of my jersey to see if my name's on there. Yeah, it is, I'm not dreaming. This is what I had pretended about, getting introduced in front of your home crowd. And when he introduced me, he put that little extra mustard on it. And he said, and now Villanova University and Wilmington, Delaware, captain of the special teams, our own Kevin Riley. I came out of that shoot, I don't even remember my feet touching the ground. Five years later to the exact date, I wake up finally outside of intensive care in Sloan Kettering Hospital in New York City, minus the left arm, a left shoulder, and four ribs. That's a prosthetic device, it's made of Kevlar. You know what Kevlar is? Bulletproof. If I'm ever in a fight in a bar in Southie, I'm leading with this shoulder. <laughs> I wasn't the average guy on the street. I fell really far from being a professional athlete who was really proud of his body and being in shape to now missing most of the left side of my body. The morning started out with me having a lot of negative thoughts. How would I recover? How would I make a living? I had children that were two, one, and infant at the time. You'll never be able to tie, tie shoes again. It can't be done one hand. But believe me, I've been trying for 25 years. And then he asked me to pull on his tie. And at that point, I was really glad he didn't ask me to pull on his finger. But I, I pulled on his tie. And it was one of those clip-on ties that I had worn to school. And I said, why will I need clip-on ties? He said, you'll never be able to tie your tie again. It can't be done one hand. That believe me, I've been trying for 25 years. One of the things that I was told very, very early on by Rocky Blyer, consistent persistence uh, after you fail is really something that many people don't have in their you know, skill sets. We're in a recession right now, and so many people feel like they're victims, and they're waiting for the recession to be over. Why wait? What are you doing to better yourself? Take a class, something you always wanted to do. The human spirit is tougher than anything that can happen to it. If you combine that with consistent persistence, somewhere deep down, you have the gumption, you have the courage, you have the fortitude to make things better. As a result of losing my arm, I've got this tremendous opportunity now of going around the country being a motivational speaker. And I get to talk to people about overcoming obstacles. And if I can help people just to see that there's light at the end of the tunnel and that sometimes bad things happen that result in very good future endeavors, then I want to get that message out to everybody. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. As Taylor Swift said to her last boyfriend, I won't keep you long. <laughs> I uh, live and die by the Eagles. We got any Eagle fans in here? Few, okay. I bleed Eagle Green, so I always have to get grounded when I'm in a group like this. Do we have any Dallas Cowboy fans in the house? Don't be afraid. <laughs> all right, for you guys, I'll talk slow, all right? <laughs> so, go. you're a Cowboy fan, right? Yeah. When there's four Cowboys in the car, who's driving? You should know this, it's a sheriff. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry 
Jones is the you know, owner of the team, and he just announced this morning on ESPN Radio that in the 2019 year, all their home games, the Cowboys home games, are, go are not going to be on ESPN or the NFL channel. They're going to be on the History Channel because all of their fans are living in the past. <laughs> so I'm here today to hopefully uh, talk a little bit about my life and a little bit about a little disease that I see is happening with our young people in the modern era. Okay, we have this little fancy thing that's called an iPhone that uh, has become the electronic sweatshop of the new millennium. But I wanted to talk about what I perceive out there is we're starting to become a nation of victims. People are starting to believe that nothing is their fault. It's not my responsibility. I don't have to, I guess I have to change. Oh, I'm going to turn it on. I thought I'd turn it on. Can you hear me now? How about now? Better? Okay. Your president would be very unhappy with you right now. Do you know your president when he went to college? He didn't get a scholarship. Mark Rainer, but he had a unique job. He worked his way through college. He was a hard-working guy. He worked his way through college as a Chippendale. <laughs> Just kidding. Anyway, I think there are a lot of victims out there, people who don't take responsibility. And by the way, when you don't take responsibility for your actions, you will continue to play over and over in your brain again the obstacles and the bad things that happen to you. I've had quite a few bad things happen to me, and I think I have a little bit of experience in this word called resilience. And somebody once said, well, how do you get it? Well, I'm going to tell you a little story today, and I'm going to tell you a story about some people that I have met that I put right up here with resilience. And I want you to compare that to the problems that you have in your life, where you see that you have what may be real, the obstacles. Because we all have, I can tell you right now, the only person on this earth without problems is already six feet under a grid. Everybody's got issues. Everybody's got problems. You're not alone. So I'll begin by telling you the story about back in the day, back in the late 50s, early 60s, before there were 300 channels on TV or the internet, it wasn't unusual for a guy like me to go out in the backyard before the iPhone became available, and during the 20 minutes of unforgiving whatever we had time, I would go out and grab a ball and pretend. Play a little basketball, throw a football around and pretend. Pretend I was a Philadelphia Eagle or a Philadelphia Philly. And I feel bad for you guys today that are so caught up in the technology. Not that it's a bad thing, but it seems to take over sometimes those things that I really needed and really respected as a kid. You know, pretending back in the day was just another way of dreaming. And when you're dreaming like that, you wouldn't believe what goes on in your subconscious. That was automatically going on my bucket list as I was pretending. And you can't pretend without narrating your story. And so I would be pretending and I would also be commentating. And one of the things that's helped me to do is I've done Eagles Radio for 16 years, and I've done some uh, TV work uh, doing football games on college and high school level also. So you never know. So moving a little bit forward, I went to Salesiano High School where we had a great football team my senior year. We were undefeated. I know there's some student athletes in here. Raise your hand. We have some student athletes. Okay. We were undefeated my senior year. We had 11 guys go to college with football scholarships. It's never been duplicated. And I was fortunate enough to go to Villanova University. A while at Villanova, played pretty well, and by my senior year, the scouts in the NFL were looking to draft me. <clears throat> Not only did I get drafted by the NFL team, I got drafted at the time by the world champion Miami Dolphins. In 1972, if you can Google this, because I know I'm old, but in 1972, they won every game. They're the last NFL team to win every game during the course of the season. Think how special that is. 
Well, here I am, 22 years old, the first day of practice. I'm in a locker room with guys that I've been reading about in Sports Illustrated since I was a junior at Salesiana. Larry Zaka, Jim Kick, Mercury Morris, Don Shul is our, our head coach. These were living legends in my mind. And I'm 22 years old and I'm in the same locker room with them, and guess what? In my head, I'm saying, I don't belong here. These guys are all pros. They're the best of the best. They're the Super Bowl champs. Nobody beat them at all this year. What am I doing here? Now, to add insult to injury, there were 22 rookies and three agents who were going to be battling for two open positions on the team. Let me give you the conditions. Miami, during the summer months, very hot, very humid, usually in the mid-90s. We had two and a half hour practices in the morning, two and a half hour practice in the afternoon. Full pads, full hitting, full contact, and no water on the field. And if you passed out, they just moved the huddle, and they thought that there was something wrong with you from the standpoint of being strong. Had nothing to do with it. Anybody that passed out was dehydrated. But that was the toughness role they played there. So imagine having 10 weeks of that in practice. Well, the first night I was down there, I was a little bit social, and I thought, I'm going to talk to one of the veterans. So I went up to one of the veterans, Manny Fernandez, and I said, uh, hey, Manny, can I ask you a question? Yeah, what is it, Brooklyn? I said, well, I just want to make sure that the, the, uh, you know, the, the meeting we have tonight starts at 7 o'clock. No, you've got that wrong already. It starts at 7.15 and make sure you're there at 7.05 because that's Shula time. You've got to be there way ahead of the coach. Okay, great. So I get there at 5 after 7, and uh, I'm five minutes late for the 7 o'clock meeting. And all of the uh, veterans are having a big laugh on my part. You see, they're not going to help us. So my first day, I uh, distinguished myself while being the first player fined by the head coach for coming in late. And you know how bad that was. Add to that, the first five days of practice, all of these veterans did was pound on you. And nobody would help you if you were you know, confused about a defense or an offensive play. After five days in that heat and struggling, and I'm figuring, what am I doing here? Let's see, there's 10 more weeks of this, they're gonna beat up on us. You know, I'm gonna call home tonight. I don't think with this anymore. This is, this is really torture. You know, what are my chances of making this team? So, <coughs> I went home, I mean, I went to the, we had these things called pay phones. They were on the wall. And I called home for the first time. And uh, I got in touch with my dad. He would always give me great advice. And so I explained my dilemma to him. And I was trying to sell him. I was trying to sell him, like, hey, it's okay to quit, isn't it? You know, this is crazy. I said, hey, dad. The chances of me making his team are slim and none of slim just walk out the door. And he listened, and then he said to me, you know what? He said, you're 22 years old now. And he said, you're an adult. I can't make that decision for you. Well, let me ask you a question, big guy. What are you going to tell the legions of guys that played before you at your legendary Salesian 100 years of athletic um, excellence? What are you going to tell those people when you go back home? You're going to tell me quit? Isn't the motto of your school, tenui nekri mitam, which means I have taken hold and will not let go, or if you wanted to put it into a vernacular today, never ever give up? How do you tell those guys? I don't know. I'm just saying. Well, that disturbed the heck out of me. On my way back to the dormitory, I thought, you know what? I've been playing all my games. I've been playing back here. I'm afraid to make a mistake. I'm not playing aggressively. I'm, I've lost my confidence. The worst thing that can happen to you as an athlete or in any line of work you have, when you lose your confidence, you're really backpedaling. You're cautious. I said, tomorrow I'm going to go out and I'm just going to give it my all. I'm going to be aggressive. If I make mistakes, I have one. But I'm going to be aggressive because that's who I am. So if you ever want to get attention on a football field from the coaches, there's one thing you can do immediately to get their attention, and that is start a fight. And if you start a fight with the baddest, meanest guy on the team, it really gets their attention. And that guy's name was Larry Zonka. He was our 240-pound bulldozer on the fullback and was all pro about four or five years. And I knew that it wouldn't last long because he wasn't going to tire himself out on some rookie who's going to get cut in a week or two. 
And the bite only lasts about 30 seconds. But you know what? The coach will run. Hmm. About him. Taking on the big guy. And from then I started to play aggressively. And I started to get noticed. And one by one, those 22 rookies started to leave in the middle of the night. I'd get a knock on my door. Hey, Rob. It'd be midnight. They never left during the day. Because I was embarrassed. Taxi's waiting. We'll see you. Good, good meeting you. And my bag would be sitting over there. I go, no. I'm going to stay. Keep leaving, guys. When we get down to the final cut, and all of a sudden they place all the special team rosters for the first regular season game up on the wall. For those of you who aren't familiar with special teams, that is any time the ball is kicked. We were usually second string players, but if that's what you got to do to make the team, you'd be glad to be on it. And all of a sudden, I'm being talked to by the veteran. Matter of fact, Manny Fernandez comes up and says, Hey, Rook, look like you made the team. Congratulations. And hey, don't screw up. Well, thanks for the confidence, Manny. But it did look like I had the team made until the Dolphins happened to pick up a guy that flushed out of a second round draft pick out of Penn State. And Mr. Joe Paterno himself made a call to Don Shula, and I get called into Shula's office, and he said, Sorry, big guy, but. You had the team made up until we had this opportunity. This guy can play two positions you can't play, and uh, we're going to have to release you. Well, I, my eyes hit the floor like a ton of bricks. And the coach came over, and he didn't have to, and he grabbed me right here, and he said, listen. He said, you came within this much of making the world champions team. You can play in this league. As a matter of fact, there are three teams that are already interested in it. The Oakland Raiders, the Minnesota Vikings, and a team I think you'll recognize, the Philadelphia Eagles. But I was still really down. I had put in all this effort for 10 weeks and to get my legs taken out from me like that. How lucky can you get? This guy gets cut, the turner makes a phone call to the coach, tells him, trust me, he can play two positions, but Riley can't. And I'm on a plane on my way home with my tail between my legs. Well, it dawned on me about halfway through that plane ride, that if one of these teams picks me up, they got to put me on the 53-man roster, not the uh, taxi squad, not the practice squad. And I didn't think about that when I left the coach's office. As a matter of fact, I got a call within weeks, and I was on the Eagles roster playing against the St. Louis Cardinals out in St. Louis. They called me on a Friday, and I was playing special teams on a Sunday. So here I was, 1973. I'm playing in my hometown. I'm playing on the special teams. Not bad. It ain't, it ain't Miami, but it ain't bad. By the way, Dolphins won back-to-back -back Super Bowls if I had just stayed. But it wasn't meant to be. And I'll use that phrase a lot because there's a lot of things that you can't control that weren't meant to be, but you don't know what the outcome's going to be. And they look like bad things at the time, but they really turn out in the long run to be something good. So I, I uh, really became a very good special team player, and they made me captain of the best special teams. And in 1974, we were going to play our first Monday night football game in five years. We weren't very good in the early 70s. Uh, and the team we were going to play on Monday night football was the Dallas Cowboys, who had beaten us nine straight times. They had beaten us so badly so many times in a row that they kind of treated us as if we were the Pottstown Firebirds instead of the Philadelphia Eagles. A lot of trash talking on the field. What could you do? They were beaten. But on this particular night in October 1979, we had the opportunity. And we had the players, and we had a new quarterback by the name of Roman Gabriel and a new middle linebacker by the name of Phil Berger. We had the opportunity to possibly beat the Cowboys on Monday Night Football. We were only three-point underdogs. An hour before the game, our special teams coach, Dick LeBeau, comes in. And he says, Riles, get this kickoff team and get into our meeting room right now. I said, Coach, what's up? He said, just do it. So I got the 10 guys together. I thought maybe something had happened to somebody's family member. And we get in the room, and the coach comes in, and he closes the door. A big smile comes over his face, and he says, you guys are the luckiest special teams in the NFL. He said, the coaches and the owners have decided that in order to get the 12th man into this game, to get that crowd out there behind you, and screaming so loud that Roger Staubach won't be able to call the signals for the Cowboys that they're going to introduce the special teams. That never happens. 
But the reason they were going to do it is because at Veterans Stadium, and if you don't remember this, your parents will, there was a group called the 700 level. They were a bunch of ragtag, blue collar workers, and some of them were let out on Sundays on furloughs from the prison because they were the blue collar workers that were in the stadium. And they identified with us because we were the guys that were throwing our bodies around very crazily trying to make the team and stay on the team. So they thought if they introduced us, the 700 level would get it, they'd start screaming and it would cascade down through the rest of the stadium. By the time the third guy got introduced, you couldn't hear yourself think. I'm checking the back of my jersey. This isn't happening, is it? Is my name on the back of this jersey? This was the thing I was pretending about 12 years ago in the backyard, wearing an Eagles jersey, being introduced as the captain of the special team on Monday night football in front of 70,000 fans, and they've been drinking since 12. And I'm thinking to myself, every girl I've ever dated, every guy I've ever had a fight on is going to see me get introduced to them. in this cool. It was so loud that Bobby Picard turned around to me and he was so excited, he was screaming something, I couldn't hear a word he was saying, but I could feel the spittle coming off his mouth and hitting me in the face. Well, by the time they got to my introduction, the guy that was the broadcaster for the Eagles, he still is, Don Baker, he still is for the Philadelphia Phillies. He put a little extra mustard on my introduction. And now for Villanova University and Wilmington, Delaware, captain of the special teams, our own homegrown number 52, Kevin Riley. I don't even remember my feet touching the astroturf. I floated out the 10 guys that were set personal high jump records. We almost wore ourselves out pre-game because we were so excited. We cut into the chase. With three seconds left to go in the game, the score is tied 10 to 10. And we are at the Dallas Cowboys 38-yard line. We call a timeout to have our field goal kicker come on, Tom Dempsey, and hopefully he can make a 48-yard field goal. My job is to make sure on this field goal that I close, make a block on the guy coming through the gap, and then I got to spin outside and hit this wide receiver who's going to fly in from left field just try to throw his body over the ball to get his hand on it. I just got to get a piece of him or knock him off his, his path. So I get the big guy here and I'm moving out there and I barely get the guy before he gets to the ball. And I'm on the ground because I threw my body at him and I watch the ball go through the uprights. We win the game 13-10 on Monday Night Football. I'm 25 years old, I have 235 pounds, I have a 400 pound bench press, and I run a 40 and 4.75. And we just beat the Cowboys on Monday Night Football. It doesn't get any better than this. Was my kids would say not. Because the reason I tell you about that one special moment in my athletic career was I want to take you forward five years down the road to the exact month when I wake up in Sloan Kettering Hospital in New York City, minus a left shoulder, a left arm, and four ribs. The prosthetic device made a Kevlar. I'm laying there and I'm out of intensive care after two days of intensive care. And for the first time, I have most of the tubes pulled out of me. You know, here I am laying in a bed thinking about what will tomorrow bring? Did the doctor get all of the tubes? And I keep looking up at these three little pictures a two year old, a one year old, and an infant. Will I ever be a dad for them? Will I be able to make a living? Will they ask me to come back to work at Xerox, where I ended up working for 30 years? I don't know the answers to any of these questions. The most important, though, is that he get all of the tumor, because that's why I had this drastic operation. Now think about me. Five years before, I had tackled Joe Namath, John Riggins, and O.J. Simpson. I had come from being a very proud professional athlete now laying in a hospital bed, missing most of the left side of my body, with huge obstacles in front of me. Huge obstacles. So much so that I was starting to get a little crazy. I had to put down the pictures of my kids every time I looked over, I teared up. <clears throat> and I asked the nurse to come in, she said, what do you want? And I said, I would like you to keep any visitors and any phone calls away from me today. I said, why? 
I said, I have to wrap my head around this new situation. It's overwhelming. And she said, you're going to have a big pity party, aren't you? I said, maybe I am. Well, about an hour into my pity party, a guy appears at my doorway. I don't recognize him. He's got a white smock on and he's got credentials, but I still don't know who he is. I haven't seen this guy. He's an older gentleman. And he knocks on the frame of my door and before I can say, come in, or how do you do, or who are you, he walks towards me. And I notice him. I notice that he has one arm. He's a volunteer. He's a volunteer of the hospital, and he comes in to counsel people who have lost limbs, as he lost his limb in World War II. And he brought me this really neat little knife that's got a thick blade on it, and he made me work it to show me how I could cut my meat with it. And then he had this soft pillow thing that I didn't know what it was. But he said, this is a soft prosthetic device that you can wear. And I said, well, I'm going to get a permanent one in 10 weeks. Why would I want to wear that one? Oh, he said, because it's nice and soft and it won't mess up your scars. Because you've got over 140 stitches in you. And he said, uh, this will be really nice and light on you. And I said, well, why would I need that in the next 10 weeks? He said, listen, you want to walk out of here without your left sleeve of your jacket hanging down around your ankle. You want to walk out of here with some semblance of dignity. Holy mackerel. I'm, wa I'm worried now about walking out of a Sloan Kettering Hospital in New York City, into the streets of New York, with a sense of dignity. When just five years ago, I was tackling some of the greatest stars to ever play in the NFL. Boy, have I fallen hard, and boy, have I fallen deep. I was hardly listening to what he was saying, and he said to me, by the way, the reason I'm here today is to make sure that you have an exercise program in place before you leave the hospital. Guys and gals, I broke out laughing. Is this guy kidding me? I am worried about so many other things, but I am not worried about exercise right now. And he said, well, I, I can see you laughing. Let me explain further. He said, we know for certain, from an average, that in the first 18 to 24 months after a person loses a limb of any kind, they gain about 40 pounds due to inactivity, depression, and sometimes the drugs that they have to take that cause them to, to eat more. So we want to make sure that doesn't happen to you because see, you already have 26 pounds on one side of your body, and I didn't know that, that you don't have on the other side. And so if you were to continue to add additional weight that would go to the right side of your shoulder and your arm, you would really jeopardize having disc problems and you'd be back in here for that. Or you could have high blood pressure and actually have heart issues. So we want to make sure before you leave here that you have a plan in place to at least do some walking and this, that, and the other. So he said, what do you like to do for exercise? So I took a deep breath. I figured, you know, this guy's trying to help me. I'm going to put my big girl panties on and try to work with you. What do you like to do for exercise? I said, well, before I got sick a couple months ago, I was competing in some 5Ks, and, and I was just doing it so I could keep my weight down. And, you know, I started to get together with some buddies from Salesiana on Saturdays, and we would jog together and talk, and we'd have coffee afterward. And I'm starting to get a little bit upbeat, a little bit motivated, thinking about a real-life situation. And all of a sudden, Frank says, oh, whoa, 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 oh, okay, oh, 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 I got to stop it. He said, I'm no doctor or nurse or anything. You, you can't be leaving here and going out job. And I said, why? He said, well, look, that weight, I, I'm going to be honest with you because I know this. I'm experienced. I've been missing an arm for 30 years. For the first year, you're going to have a hard time balancing yourself physically and then mentally. Your brain has to start making compensation for you not having this other arm. You're going to be walking down the street, and you're just going to go like this sometime. And it's going to happen all over. I don't want to see you leaving here jogging and having that kind of problem. And I would almost sure that you'd have a disc problem if you started that early. Maybe in a year or two you could do that. What else do you like to do? I said, well, I don't know. I, I just joined the DuPont Country Club. He had been golf. Oh, he said, wait a minute, wait a minute, Mr. Cobb. First of all, it doesn't have the aerobic conditioning, but I'm so glad you brought that up because it reminded me of something very important I wanted to tell you. I said, what's that? He said, well, a buddy of mine, he lost his left arm like you did in one day. Over at the Wilmington Country Club, he was playing golf, and without that left arm, that left arm's a guide. That left arm is your guide to make sure you hit the ball, you know, square. And he said one day when it was real cold and the ground was still frozen, he didn't have that left arm as a guide, and he hit two inches behind the ball, and the club stopped, and his hand came through, and he broke his wrist. 
And I said, your point is? My point is that you've got to take really good care of the one good arm where you're going to find out who your real friends are. And you didn't have to pay me any pictures. So he could see I was spiraling down. And he said, what do you do for a living? And I said, well, I work for the Xerox Corporation. What do you have to wear working today? I said, I have to wear a suit, usually a coat and tie, and shirt and tie, and dress shoes like you have on there. Oh, he said, like these, and he put his big foot up on my bed. And I said, yeah, I got a pair of wingtip tie shoes just like that. He said, not like this, you know. I said, Frank, I do. They're the same color. They got the same skinny, you know, uh, shoe strings that I'm, you know, to tie in. I said, they might not be the same size, but the same shoe. He said, give me your hand. I gave him my hand. He said, I want you to hold on to this little tab. And I noticed, yeah, this does have a little tab that my shoes don't have. And he said, now pull up on the tab. And when I pulled up on the tab, they were Velcro shoes. It was a Velcro flap. The shoes were pre-tied. And he said, if you're going to have to tie your shoes, you're going to have to get, you're going to have to get these pre-tied. And I said, why? He said, you'll never be able to tie your shoes again. It can't be done one-handed. I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, now I want you to pull on my tie. At that point, I was really glad he didn't pull on my shoe. Uh, he asked me to pull on his finger. But I pulled on his tie. And it was one of those clip-on ties that I wore to school when I was in grade school. I went to Catholic grade school in Yellow Earth. My mother didn't have time to tie my tie, so I had these clip-on ties. He said, you'll have to get these clip-on ties. I said, why? He said, you'll never be able to tie your tie again. It can't be done one-handed. I've been trying for over 30 years. And if you use my name down at the tie shop, they'll give you a discount. So, when he walked out that day, he was supposed to be there. I know his intentions were good. He was there to help me. But he did nothing but stir up more things. I started to think about, boy, I got a stick chef who was sitting in the drive. How many of you drive that? Buttons and zippers and keyboards. Oh, my. And I'm starting to think of all of these things that I haven't even touched upon that I might not be able to do or can struggle with. And just then the nurse came in and she said, are you going to answer the phone? And I said, nope. She said, why? I said, because that guy just depressed the hell out of me. I'm not talking to anybody else. She said, pick up that phone. This guy can help me. When I picked up the phone and I heard who it was, and I recognized his voice, his name is Rocky Dwyer. You want to Google him later. He played for the Pittsburgh Steelers, but before he played with the Steelers, he went over to Vietnam and did his duty. He got drafted right out of the Steelers training camp and had to go to Vietnam. While in Vietnam, he had his leg caught in a shrapnel from a landmine that really messed up his right leg. Blew his big toe off, messed up his calf, and deteriorated his ACL. So they wanted to fuse his leg at the knee, and he would not allow the doctors to do that. He said, fix me up otherwise, but do not fuse my leg at the knee. That would have made him his leg stiff, and he would have had it the rest of his life. Upon being released from the hospital, the doctor, who was a colonel, said to him, why wouldn't you let us do our job? And he said, well, he said, um, I'm really going to wait and see what kind of help they can give me. The Pittsburgh Steelers are going to give me a physical and see if there's any way I'll be able to get back on the field. He said one of the most embarrassing moments of his life, he said the doctor broke out laughing at him. He said, son, you need a reality check. Not only will you never, ever play another down of football, but you'll be lucky if you ever walk again without a limit. And by the way, when the pain gets bad enough, you'll get your leg fused just like we told you. So Rocky said he had his doubts, especially on the, on the plane ride home, but following the suit, the owner of the team not only brought in two good physicians, he brought in the two best orthopedic surgeons in the country. And their take on the uh, examination was, his name was Art Rooney, he was the owner, and he loved his players. He also was a Notre Dame graduate, so was, so was Rocky, so they had a little more in common than just the average player-owner relationship. And they said, if you give us 18 months, the doctor said, 18 months and two operations and a lot of rehab, we think we might get him back on the field if he's willing to be a guinea pig. So he called Rocky and he said, here's the deal. I'll put you on the payroll for two years. Here's what they want you to do. You need two more operations and a lot of rehab. But if you do that, you go to camp, you make the team, everybody's happy. If you don't, we all know we tried our best. Rocky said, I'll do it. If you ever want to read a good book, it's called Fighting Back. It details him going two steps forward and three steps back. 
it was a heck of a comeback. But guess what? Not only did he make the team, he's got four Super Bowl rings. He was the second leading ground leader at Hunting Guy named Franco Howard. I just got a chance to introduce him four weeks ago. And he has a line of people. He brings all four Super Bowl rings with him. And he lets them put them on their hand and they take selfies with him. And one guy came off and I was talking to him. I said, it's pretty special, isn't it? He said, special? A hundred years from now, my great-great-grandchildren would say, look at this. The guy with four Super Bowl rings. Anyway, he was on the phone. We had a long talk. At the very end of the talk, he said to me, by the way, Many of the doctors, nurses, or rehab people have been in to tell you about your limitations. I said, no, but funny you should ask. It's very well volunteered for me today. I need to press the heck out. And I told Rocky the story. Rocky's a very good listener. But when I got done, he said to me, with an attitude and a passion I'll never be able to recreate, you must promise me something. Well, Rock, whatever you want, what do you need? You must promise me you won't quit on anything unless you try it a dozen times. Said Rock. Listen, the guy that was in here, I think he's a little more of an expert than you or I on losing a lift. He's been without his arm for 30 years. Rock said, expert. I said, yeah. He said, let me tell you something about expert trials. Experts built the Titanic and amateurs built the arm. Experts can be wrong. And don't you listen to anybody until you try it for yourself. And he wouldn't let up to me on me until I made a promise to him. And I knew he would follow up, so I didn't want to say yet yeah, just to get him to go away. I said, okay, okay, you got it. I won't quit on anything. He said, here's the deal. Now that you've agreed to that, he said, I'm going to tell you, you're going to fail hundreds and thousands of times. And your biggest problem is going to be patience and confidence. And he said, to help you with the patience part of it, instead of stepping back after you fail and counting to 10 before you retake the process or the project or whatever you're working on, he said, I'm going to send you a little poem. And he said, commit it to memory. It'll help you be a little more motivated than just counting to 10. So he sent me the poem, and I've said it a couple thousand times. And it goes like this. If you think you're beaten, you are. If you think you dare not, you don't. If you like to win, but you think you can't, it's almost a sense that you won't. If you think you'll lose your loss, for in this world we find success begins with a fellow's will. It's all in a state of mind. Remember, life's battles don't always go to the biggest, fastest, or strongest man, but sooner or later, the man who wins is the man who thinks he can. Well, I follow that advice. There are three things I cannot do. I cannot play the guitar, I cannot pick crabs from the Chesapeake Bay, and I cannot give the number one sign left hand to angry motors on Route 13. <laughs> but contrary to what Frank told me, I've run in five half marathons, a full marathon in Marine Corps down in Washington, D.C. And I broke 90 in golf on two occasions, something I never did with two arms. Now, I don't tell you that to say, look what I've done. Aren't I great? I tell you that because I learned this valuable lesson. And it's encapsulized it into one quote. The human spirit is stronger than anything that can happen. The human spirit is stronger than anything that can happen to you. You will find out as you travel in life that a friend of yours, a parent of yours, an uncle, an aunt, who goes through chemotherapy and radiation or some excruciating medical treatment will say, I never thought I would be able to do that. And they did. Because you know what? We don't know the power we have inside of us until we're pushed to the brink, until we're in a corner. I didn't know that I would be able to do the things I did until I got challenged by one guy. And think about that. I don't know what would have happened if he didn't come into my life that day. Nothing happens by happenstance. There was a reason God put us together that day. So I would hear that story and say, you know what? I'm drawing the line here. I'm moving forward. So what is the lesson then? The lesson is that inside of each one of us, is a hidden talent that we only use when we're in a critical situation. But you don't have to wait for that. And I'll give you one sports example. There was a guy that played in the National Football League about four years ago. He was the worst quarterback that I've ever seen by technique. The worst. You wouldn't probably have him throwing the ball like he did on your high school team let alone your college team and on an NFL team. But 
He had what I call it. He discovered the human spirit. You could pull on it in everyday operations. And his name was Tim Tebow. Now, why is he special? When you can get 53 guys in an NFL locker room who are all different cultures, beliefs, and attitudes to get galvanized, come behind him, knowing that it ain't going to be pretty, but somehow that guy's going to win the game for us, you're special. And he didn't do it in a flamboyant way. Yeah, I know about T-Bowen, but he was doing that in high school. He didn't do it to show off. That was just the thing that he did. And they tried to make fun of him and all that kind of stuff. But he's the one laughing now because he did take the Denver Broncos to a playoff game playing ugly football only because he could almost will a win because it was that important. So you don't have to wait. And so one of the things that I challenge young people with today, if I was to take a survey out here and I'd say, what are your goals? What are your goals for this year? What are your goals for three years down the road? And do you have a five-year goal? I have to say 95% of you would fall short after one year. Let me tell you this, you have to have goals in life, whether they're something that you dream about or something you pretend about. Because I found this out, if you aim at nothing, you'll hit it every time. And we got a lot of people waiting for something to happen. Look at this crazy lottery situation. The more people that get in it, the less a chance anybody has of winning it, yet everybody's talking about how they're gonna spend the money. Well, that's nice, but you could waste your energy on something a little more concrete than hoping that something good happens to you. My challenge to you today is to set some goals for yourself. The second part of that equation is once you set the goals for yourself, you have to set a process to get those goals going. How am I going to get there? If I want to be a better athlete, how do I put in the extra hours instead of going to the Thursday night, you know, cocktail party where it's going to be lot of people and I'll be well known and all that. Do I put the extra time in? Even if I'm a good student, do I put the extra time in and the extra effort to do extra credit work and to know my subject matter beyond what the scope that they're teaching here is? Those are the things you have to challenge yourself with. Now they told me that I would never run again. They told me I would never play golf again. They laughed and said they will never put a guy like you, a national broadcaster, in. Riles, you do a really nice job on the radio. It's a shame you'll never be on an NFL or college TV program. And I said, why? He said, they would never put anybody up there with one arm because it would be a distraction. And he goes, nothing against you, I'm just being candid. Well, thank you for being candid because you just put a rod on my rear end and I'm going to show you that I'm going to get on an NFL game. And so I started pursuing it. I pursue them. I can be very difficult to get rid of when I'm pursuing something. And so I talked the Eagles into letting me my, and uh, two other former Eagles do the Eagles preseason game four years ago. And I got on that TV set and I said, I set this goal, I badgered people, and now I'm here. And right before we went on the air, we had a little bit of a situation where they wanted to see if the cameras were working. And all of a sudden, it was being fed back into a great big truck where they have all the TV sets. We had, we had uh, golf shirts on. And I was standing on the right-hand side so I could interview the guys and my two co-hosts. And all of a sudden, it came from the truck. Whoa, 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 whoa. We got to set different shirts up. And I knew immediately what was going on. Now it was becoming obvious that my, in a short sleeve shirt, my arm was missing. And I was going to be distracted. It was about 90 degrees outside, and we had these lights on us. Hugh Douglas, the defensive end, was already sweating. And they brought us up long sleeve shirts to cover me up. These guys didn't know what was going on. I had it all figured out. I said, hold on a second. And, and Hugh Douglas was going, we're going to wear long sleeve shirts? It's already 95 degrees. I said, no, we're not. I said, let's just change positions. So I said, ask the back of the truck if this is good. And I just hid myself a little bit behind the other guy and we did the whole four games. And I tell you that because anybody who challenges me now and stuff, if it's worth the challenge, I try to accept it and go with it because it's always nice to be moving forward. Dick Vermeil, Coach Vermeil said, there's only one way to coast in this life. It's downhill. Unless you're constantly trying to improve and get better. 
then you're coasting. And the next step is down. So remember, set some goals for yourself. Set a process for yourself. And hold yourself responsible. Stop being a victim out there. Oh, that just happened to me because of all this. Take a look at yourself in the mirror and say, what part of this did I play? Do I owe somebody an apology? Be a bigger person. Last but not least, I'll just leave you with this. On the day that I was being operated on, I sat in my hospital room at 5.30 in the morning. It was an October cold morning. It was raining. I didn't turn the light on because I was feeling sad. And I was sitting there just thinking about what was going to happen that day, and all of a sudden, a shadowy figure hits my doorway, and as soon as they spoke, I knew who it was. It was a priest, Father O'Brien. Father O'Brien was the chaplain on the floor that week, and he said to me, I'm a Catholic, and he said, would you like to have communion? And I said, yes. And old Lovely, who taught me to slay Janum, once said, when God enters a room, fear leaves immediately. And after I got communion, 50% of my fear went away like that. And the nurse came in and gave me a shot in the rear end of the other 50%. Went out. <laughs> but I want to share with you, in all this drama that we have out there in politics right now, I want to share with you an interesting moment. I get down to the pretty out, and next thing you know, there's three of us, next thing you know, there's ten of us. All different cultures, all different backgrounds. There was a Muslim, there was a Jew, there were some Christians, there was probably an atheist in the crowd. In 20 minutes, while we're waiting to be wheeled into our operating rooms, we exchange names, of what's wrong with you, what's wrong with you, how are you doing? One singular thing, nobody cared about who was a Democrat or Republican, who was a Catholic, who was a Muslim, who was whatever. They only cared about, hey, I care for you because we all have a similar problem. It was one of those times where you didn't feel alone. You weren't the Lone Ranger. How many times do we sit back and think, this problem, nobody has but me. Are you kidding me? Everybody's got problems. You just don't know what the other guy's doing. Well, within 20 minutes, we all knew each other. And right before the First Lady gets wheeled in, she says, hold on, hold on, hold on. We'll be back. She said, can we all hold hands and say a prayer together? Sounds like a good idea to me. We all held hands. She says, does everybody know the Lord's Prayer? Well, the guy at the end, his name was Mel Schwartz. He was Jewish. He said, I don't know the Lord's Prayer, but if you guys lead, I'll follow. No argument, no drama. We're just all together here, holding hands and wishing each other luck. Wouldn't it be nice for the world to be like that? Wouldn't it be nice if we could all have a common ground? And unusually, that's not going to be the case. And I'm reminded of a quote by St. Augustine. Do not judge people on what they look to be, but judge them on what they can be. Do not judge people on what they appear to be, but judge them on what they can be. All of us have the ability to be better than we ever thought we could be. But we judge people based on race, color, creed, now it's politics. See if we could take a little kindness into the world and so I leave you with that little message. Be kind to your fellow human beings because at the end of the day, when all is said and done, wouldn't it be funny if you were standing before your God and said, here's the deal. I'm going to count the number of obstacles I threw in your way and the problems I threw in your way. I'm going to count the number of times you were resilient enough to get up and tackle those problems with a good attitude and you took responsibility. And if you got up one more time and you got knocked down and you had faith in me as God, that's all I ask to enter, to enter the gates of heaven. And think about this if you pull another two or three or four or a dozen other individuals who are less fortunate than you, less talented than you, less intelligent than you, up off the mat of life with you. Would there be an all merciful God that would keep you out of the gates of heaven? I don't think so. Remember this, there may be no such thing as magic. But there are miracles, but first you've got to believe. Thank you very much for having me. Does anybody have any questions? I can answer any questions from the Philadelphia Eagles to my situation at Sloan Kettering, whatever you want to ask, I'm ready to answer.
all the things that were yeah. yeah. Yes. Do you think the Eagles are going to make the Super Bowl this year? <laughs> Honest answer? No, and I didn't think so before the beginning of the year. You know why? And I fill in a little clue. It is so hard to get to the Super Bowl. Then it's double the effort to win the Super Bowl. The Eagles won the Super Bowl. They had to play four extra games. Okay, so add that to a 16-game season, and you play 20 games. Their last hit is in February 2nd. Everybody else has been home for Christmas. Healing, getting ready for the new year. So you play more games, you're more beat up. It takes you a longer time to heal on a shorter period. Also, you've got to celebrate a little bit, right? Guys who only did two speaking engagements the following year now have an opportunity to do 40. You think that is a little bit of a distraction from your weightlifting and your running? Okay, so you're bound to have a Super Bowl hangover. And on top of that, everybody's got your circle now. You, didn't, you know, they snuck up on some people there. Everybody's got your circle. You see how hard everybody's playing? Now, last Sunday, I'll tell you, I couldn't keep you off right away because I was just sick to my stomach. You don't lose a game like that. And what, the why they lost the game is they played very, very cautiously and very defensively. They let that team march down the field on them. So I don't think they're going to do it again, but I will tell you this. I think they'll win the division because it's a weak division. The Giants are already out. Any Giant fans here? God bless you. You're two years away from being three years away. It's going to be all right. <laughs> it's going to be fun. So they actually have a very good coach. Um, Pat Shermer is a, is a personal friend of mine. He'll get this straightened out. He's got to get Eli out of there. and He's got no backups. They need to draft a quarterback. If you don't have a good quarterback in this league or in college, you're in trouble. And so they're in trouble right now because Eli does not like to get him. <laughs> Although he's played like 175 straight games because I can't call him on that. But he just, I mean, if people get around him. He doesn't try to escape. He just tries to get down the bus. But, uh, and I don't know why he's playing. He's got more money than guys. He's got two Super Bowl rings. Why would you play behind that line? They can't protect you. Go home. Go home. Let some young kid do. Anybody else got a question? About any? What do you think? 1979. No. You sent me home from the hospital. I never had one therapy session. Yeah. It was available, but it wasn't widespread. And boy, should it have been. Because I went back to work. And you know what's crazy? I went back to work, and everybody was really nice to me for about two weeks. Give me a lot of leeway, a lot of cushion. And then it was like, hey, get back to work. And I wasn't ready. I should have eased myself in. So I, I went into a, a severe depression for about six months trying to get out of that. But let me tell you about you know, that situation. Today, I go down to Walgreen Hospital to counsel our veterans who are coming back with lost limbs. I'm a peer visitor. I've been trained so I can talk to them. And it's really crazy because they do not let them leave Walter Reed Hospital until they can complete the DLAs, the daily living activities. It's like being a, uh, a Boy Scout. You have to complete merit act. They have to be able to cook five meals. They've got to be able to do this. They've got to be able to do laundry. They gotta, if they want to drive a car, there's a simulator, and they can get their license there. And if they need anything special, it has to be approved there. And they all want to get out of there. They want to go home. They won't let them leave until they, make basic, they can do these basic activities which I think is great. But everybody asked me that. I had, a, I had a nurse challenge me three weeks ago and said there was two rehabilitative services. I said there might have been, but nobody told me about it. And so I had learned everything hard knocks. You know, and there's some funny stories about it. I'll tell you one, and uh, maybe I'll let you go. But um, I'm going to get a refining plate, a refining, uh, refinery down here on Wrangell Hill Road, there's nobody down there, it's just refineries. It's just, and I parked my car so I didn't have to go through their gate, which you needed a pass for, on an angle. And it was a 1975 Monte Carlo. 
and it had a glass on the, on the driver's side that didn't have a frame on it. So it was just a glass that people did. And on the slope, I went to pull the door shut with my hand, and it came back so fast it caught my hand in the window, and I was stuck between the window and the roof. But it wasn't killing me. I was just stuck. I couldn't get my knuckles. I yelled. I screamed. I yelled at every truck that went by. They couldn't hear me. An hour into it, I thought, well, I better see if I can get this shoe off. And I got my shoe off. And I got it wrapped up, and I got it up high enough that I could open the door. But I had to laugh at myself. Well, what was I thinking? But that's the kind of stuff that used to happen to me. And I wish I did have some therapy on it. But everything that I've learned now has been on my own. It took me 35 tries to learn how to do the top. I did more than a dozen there because I know I'd be doing it a lot. One more question. We'll let you get back to questions. Somebody asked me, I'll leave with it. Somebody asked me a comment when I was in the hallway about the hardest I was ever hit in the end. And I'll tell you that story. Um, they don't have it anymore, but on the kickoff teams, they used to have, when the kickoff return team, when they kick off to the team, they used to have what they called the wedge. And it used to be four of the biggest guys would get shoulder to shoulder to shoulder. The ball carrier would try to follow them up. And, you know, they were, they were like uh, a bulldozer, you know, four guys together. My job was a, a wedge buster. I had to knock two of them down, there was two of us. We were the bowling balls, they were the fins. And the Dallas wedge, there were four guys, three of them were all pro. It was Randy White, two Paul Jones, Jethro Pugh, and Harvey Martin, all monsters. Um, Randy was probably the smallest in 6'4", 27. And my job was to take two of them down. It's my fifth time down. We've had five kickoffs. And I'm feeling a little beat up from taking these beatings because you're throwing yourself into these monsters. And they don't like it to hit either. So we asked our kicker if he would kick it into the end zone, the other guy who was away from him. And he said, uh, I'll give it a shot. Well, he kicked the line dry, which is bad, because now they have a 10 yard head start. I remember closing my eyes, I threw a cross body block, and I got stumped. Now, back in the day, if you laid on the field, you cost the team a timeout. Now, you lay on the field for five minutes when your ear ring comes out. <laughs> and then you go off the field, and then you can come running back one five plays later. So we had to get off the field because we couldn't waste timeouts that we needed for the two minute drill in the offense. And so I looked for the sidelines, I got stumped, and I had no feeling on my right side, no, no vision on this eye, but I had tunnel vision on this one. And with this eye, I could see the sidelines, so I started stumbling over to it. And the numbness was going away, but I couldn't shake the tunnel vision. Our middle linebacker was coming on to play defense, Bill Berge, and he yells my name, and I look around with this one eye, and he grabs my helmet, and he turns it around, I was looking through my ear hole. <laughs> <coughs> and he said at the end of the game, thank God, he said, I thought you broke your neck and were running around like a <laughs> But it was a suspension helmet that they don't have anymore, thank God. True story. Thank you for having me. Have a great day. to get your photo taken with him, purchase a book, he's going to assign them for you. Uh, please take time to do that. And once again, let's give him one more well round of applause.